We are now going to skip ahead from you know early 1700s. We're going to skip all the way now to about 1890s, just about a little before that, and we're going to be introduced to our to our next great mind, which is J.J. Thompson. And J.J. Thompson, his big claim to fame in the chemical universe is that he gave us what's known as the cathode ray tube experiment, or the cathode ray experiment. And so let me take a moment <clears throat> to explain what our cathode ray tube is. As you can see, it's a good thing I am an amazing artist. But in a nutshell, here we go. So our cathode ray tube is going to look something like this. It's a glass tube, so all of this up here, right? everything that's in white, this is all glass. But it's basically just a glass tube. It usually has to be hand blown, so you know someone had to take some time to do this. Where what we're going to notice is that there is, um, actually, let me make this a little better. This should actually be kind of sealed off here and we should also seal it off over here. So what we've done is that there's only one opening in my cathode ray tube and it's kind of down here right where there's an opening and usually there would be some type of tubing where what happens is that we're trying to suck air out of the cathode ray tube. Now we refer to this usually as an evacuated chamber not a vacuum chamber right they just weren't that good back then, so we couldn't pull all the air out. But it's a chamber that has as little matter as possible. We're trying to pull air out of it. Inside of my cathode ray tube, we're going to see that there are two metal plates. Now, there's technical terms for these. They're referred to as the anode and the cathode because there is going to be electrical current running through this. For now, we're not concerned. We can just say that we have a metal plate over here on the left, metal plate number one, and then we have a metal plate over here on the right. Okay, so these are our metal plates. And finally, the last thing that our cathode ray tube is going to need is it's going to require a little bit of juice. It's going to need some type of electrical input. This could be from a battery, it could be from an outlet, whatever it is, but we do have to run electrical current. Now I'm not going to get into how we complete the circuit and any of that stuff right now, but what you just want to understand is that in theory, in this cathode ray tube, electrical current whoop, is coming this way, right over here from the left and electrical current is leaving whoop, that way over there from the right so we have electrical current input and some electrical current that is leaving so as long as you have that awareness we should be in good shape now how did my cathode ray tube work well what happened is that as scientists started to play with this electrical current they started to ask the question as you may have thought well what exactly is electricity? And so they, they knew it was negatively charged current, electrical current, but they couldn't break it down further. They didn't know exactly where it came from. And the cathode ray tube gave us our first insight into this because what would happen is that when a scientist that had a cathode ray tube, such as this one, when a scientist would turn that electricity on and would get electrical current flowing, what we would see is that here in the middle, there would be this intense green beam that would shoot literally from one side to the other, right? So what we would see is that we would literally have something like this, right? This green beam kind of going back and forth, right? In my cathode ray tube. And what was interesting about this was that the more matter we put into it, so if let's say we didn't evacuate the chamber, then you could barely see the green beam, right? The better we did at kind of removing matter from the chamber, then the brighter the beam would get. And so scientists were baffled by that because, well, where exactly is that green beam coming from? What is it? And so what Thompson does is he goes, well, let's study that green beam. And what I mean by that is he does the following. When he turns on the cathode ray tube and the green beam gets shot across, he places inside of it a paddle wheel, right? Think of like if you've ever seen like a little kid with a pinwheel, you know, the ones that you blow on and then it kind of spins, right? So he takes and he places this paddle wheel inside of the cathode ray tube. And when he does that, lo and behold, he sees that the paddle wheel begins to spin, right? And so what this tells him, as soon as he sees that the paddle wheel is in fact spinning is that obviously the green beam contains some mass in it. The green beam has to be made of particles because what's happening is that the particles are literally coming in and they're 
pushing, right? They're pushing the blades of the paddle wheel. And as they push, because they have a certain mass, the paddle wheel then spins accordingly. So this is the first major uh, breakthrough because now what Thompson realizes is that, well, obviously there are particles that are entering the chamber that were not in the chamber originally, especially if I pulled them all out. So then he goes, all right, well, what can we discover about those particles? And so what he decides to do is he decides to place a magnet on top of the, the cathode ray tube. Right. And so for our purposes, we'll say that our magnet is going to now be, we'll take the negative side of the magnet. Think of it kind of like, let's say you put the north side of the magnet. So he puts the negative side of the magnet up to against the cathode ray tube. And when he does, lo and behold, he notices that the beam actually deflects away. And so the moment that he produces and he introduces my magnet to the cathode ray tube when he puts a negative side towards it the beam deflects away and if he happens to change the magnet's position swip, uh, swap it around and he puts the positive side or let's say the the north side of the magnet or south side of the magnet rather against the glass what he then realizes is that now he sees that the green beam actually deflects towards it. And again, I would suggest, as amazing as these uh, brilliant artistic renditions are, I would suggest you actually Google and look up some of this video because it's really neat to see it in real time. And you're like, you know, the first time you'll see it, you'll kind of be dumbfounded, as I imagine scientists back in the 1800s were. And so what Thompson realizes, whether he meant to or not, is that he has discovered these particles inside of an evacuated chamber that seem to be negatively charged. And so he wonders, well, where did these negative particles come from? Because they don't seem to be any positive particles, right? If there were positive particles, then when he had the magnet up, as we see here, we would see that the, that the, the sum of the, the beam is deflecting away. But no, they are only negative particles. And so what he starts to realize is that the only negative particles or the only negative input that he was putting to this whole thing was back over here, where he had his electrical current. And so what he starts to think about is he says, well, what if we started to load up these plates with all of these negative particles? So a negative particle, negative particle, negative particle, negative particle, negative particle. If I loaded it up with enough negative particles, then at some point they're going to repel each other and they're going to literally boop, jump to the other side. And so that's what he realizes that the green beam must represent. It's got to be these negatively charged particles. But then he goes, well, I get that they were in the current. I was pushing something along through the current. But at some point, those particles leapt from metal plate to the other metal plate. And so after much, you know, thinking about it and doing a lot of calculation, what Thompson realizes is that our model of the atom, how Dalton has theorized that it's indivisible, is actually incorrect. And so what he says is he goes, look, it's not that when we look at an atom, we see this perfect little sphere. Instead, what he says is all of this purple stuff represents the positive area. And within that positive area, there are these negatively charged particles, which he refers to as electrons. And so what he says is that there is something smaller than an atom. There are subatomic particles, and he is the first person to discover the presence of the electron. Now, notice I didn't talk at all about the positive particle because Thompson has no concept that there is such a thing as a proton. According to Thompson, he has placed these negative particles inside of this C or inside of this positive dough. And I use the word dough, right, D-O-U-G-H, because according to Thompson, he named 
this model of the atom, the plum pudding model of the atom. Now, plum pudding is a British dish. It's a yummy dessert, I guess. Don't know. But that was his wheelhouse. Instead, what I usually refer to it, and when I see it, is that, and this makes more sense to me, I see this as the chocolate chip cookie model, where imagine all of the electrons are the actual individual chocolate chips, and then you have the, the purple is the positive dough that the electrons are floating in. So we take it one step at a time, one tick at a talk, and you'll be there in virtually no time.